Hey guys, can I remember the season premiere of Outlander, season 2, episode 1, Through a Glass Darkly, and I could not wait for this premiere. You guys know how much I love the first season of Outlander, it was a huge surprise for me, and I really was interested in seeing where this season was headed, because where we left off in the last season, it really seemed like we were going in a more positive direction, kind of them trying to get over all the damage that happened, especially after a really rough final two episodes, I mean, really hard stuff to watch. You guys know how, as much as I love that season one finale, I can't really watch, I mean, I could probably watch it again, but it's a very hard episode to probably watch again, because it just, it, it's it's a tough episode, especially episode 15, you guys know how hard it was for me to review and watch uh, that episode one for prison, so I was really wondering what direction we're going in in season two, and then when I watched the trailer, I was very confused, because you guys know there was that one scene that seemed like Claire just somehow gets back into um, the 1940s, only for me to realize that the first half of this episode, the first, like, 37 minutes, is all of that. It's the aftermath of Claire getting back, and this was an amazing premiere. I love the contrast between the two worlds. I loved everything we got into, and I can already tell it's going to be a very different, but a really great season. Like, the end of this episode, I'm just like, this is going to be an awesome season. I can't wait to see the rest of it. And uh, I'm glad they put this premiere up early. And it would make sense because they put the first episode up early. So that would make sense um, when, you know, the show first came out. So let's just get into this episode. There's a lot to talk about. There's probably going to be quite a long review because I really do want to get into it. And uh, we see right away, Claire wishes that she, we see this monologue. And Claire's saying that she wishes she was dead. And if she'd keep her eyes shut, she could have almost touched the edges of oblivion. But she made a promise and had to keep it even if it meant living the life she no longer wanted. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Because it looks like she's just, you know, in Scotland or whatever. And she wakes up, sees the stones in Craig Dune. Yeah, she's back in Craig Dune. She screams when she realizes she's no longer in the 1700s. And says the world she had left only moments ago was now dust. And we realize she's back in 1945. Which I was freaking out about, but a car then comes her way. The guy gets out, asks her if she's all right. She says nothing and and uh, asks if her if she speaks English. Claire asks what year it is, and we realize it's not only did she get back to the present. It's now 1948. It's no longer 1945. It's four years later. It's 1948, and three years later actually. Um, three years later, 1948, and um. She asks the man who won the Battle of Culloden, and the man asks if she feels well. He says he could take her, and she grabs him, begs him for him to tell her the answer. We don't really know what all this is about for her wanting to know who won the Battle of Culloden, but she obviously really wants to know this answer, and she's freaking out about it. And basically, he says with the British, she sobs as she lets go of the man looking defeated, and that's how this episode starts. Really crazy way to start it. Let me talk about the intro, though, because I really love that they actually update the intro, because as you guys know, the show is no longer in Scotland. It's now in France. France. That's where we're going to be for the majority of the season. So I like that this intro, it felt like the French culture. I mean, the, the you know, the, the classical music in the background, even half of the intro being in French. I thought it was a really cool idea the way they did that. Because, yeah, 1700s France is way different than 1700s Scotland. I think they showed that very well. Even though, like I said, the first, like, 37 minutes episode, it doesn't even take place in um, the 1700s. It takes place in you know, 1948. We see Frank comes into the hospital and asks to see the nurse and says he received a call from Dr. Edwards. Now I gotta say, I really just, again, I gotta applaud Tobias Menzies because he just had to go from being this really... Um, you know, evil character Jack, because, you know, this this sadist character Jack who tortured Jamie, and we still kind of have that in our minds, but we also have to remember that he also plays Frank, Claire's husband, and he just plays these two characters so differently because they are such different characters, and he realizes that, and any other actor, I mean, I feel like they would pull it off well, but to, Tobias Menzies, I think, really just understands the way that both these characters are, what makes them take, what makes them different. There's so many things that make e these two characters so different, and it can't be easy easy to play two different characters, but it really pulled it off perfectly. It really just felt like we were reintroduced to Frank in this episode, and I definitely really enjoyed that. It's been a while since we saw him. We haven't seen Frank, of course, since the mid-season finale of season one, and basically tells Frank that Claire's resting uncomfortably, but is suffering from hydration, superficial cuts, and bruises notwithstanding, and she seems to be in good health, but emotionally, she's better now. They gave her a sedative last night, and today she's much better. Frank comes in, Claire tells him to turn the radio off, and she says it's noisy there, reintroduces herself, and 
She says she's back, and he says he's so grateful. And that was the line in the trailer where I was like, what, what, what's going on here? And basically, at, at first, I, would, I couldn't really figure out what's going on here. He asks if he is, and he says with all of his heart, however, when she sees him, she sees him as Jack when he comes closer, which would make sense because the last time she saw someone with the last name Randall, it was someone that deeply affected her husband. And you can just tell the Claire that we're with now is not the Claire that we started out with, and that's something I really love is the development with Claire. I mean, she's very broken after coming back. I mean, just imagine if you were in this century, you've been there for about two years, and all of a sudden you're back, and now things have changed, and now you have to readjust to the world. They really did all that perfectly. I really think they showed you know, realistically, what would happen if you went through two worlds? And something else I liked is that time has passed. In other time travel things, time hasn't passed. But this wasn't exactly time travel, rather than she just is transported to another century. And it wasn't exactly time travel, which I definitely did like. They didn't treat it as time travel, and they really treat it as something different, and I really enjoyed that. So... A photographer then comes in to take pictures of Claire and Frank, and the nurse kicks him out. Frank then tells Claire he's spoken with Reverend Wakefield, and he's prepared a room for them while she, convul while she convalesce and assures her that no one will bother them there. And she asks if he knows if Mrs. Graham is still in the building, because Mrs. Graham is the one that introduced her to all this stuff, you remember, like Craig Nadoon and all that stuff. And he says he didn't ask, but he would assume so. She says she needs to speak with her. She says that she's just going to still find some clothes, and he looks at what she was wearing, and is very confused, because, again, he doesn't know where she is. He just knows that she was taken from him, and he doesn't really know how. So, obviously, he's kind of confused as to where this is all coming from. So... Basically, Wakefield and Frank are in the room watching Claire, and he asks Frank if she said anything, and he says only pleasantries. He's received an answer from his friend, Professor Atkins, and Wakefield grabs a letter that says he's examined the clothing. He said, it appears to be a marvelous example of 18th century Scottish woman wardrobe, and is incredibly valuable, and asks where he found it. And Wakefield said, it's a good question, asks what he's going to tell him, and he asks what he could tell him, because it's not the kind of outfit that Claire could have just worn in any shop. Obviously, it's a 1700s outfit, the only logical reason that there was like a costume party but obviously that really wouldn't make sense because it's the middle of spring and Wakefield says he's exhausted his collection of Culloden and the Jacobite and the Jacobite Rebellion and asks why she has such a sudden obsession with Scottish history and Frank says that he has no idea she never showed much interest before Wakefield says that she's been back a week and it's time she give him some answers Frank says he thinks she will when she's ready and Wakefield says he's not the only one with questions shows him an article in the newspaper about Claire from the photographer that took the pictures and Basically, obviously, everyone wants to know where she's come from, why she's come back, where she, you know, just everything that happened to her. Obviously, everyone's very confused because all of a sudden, this woman's just come back and they don't know where she's come from. So Claire then talks to Mrs. Graham, obviously, like I said, the woman that introduced her to all this stuff, and tells her that there has to be a fuller account of the Highlander losses somewhere. And Graham says the Reverend has the finest collection in Scotland. Even the curator of old Leonock Cottage himself has been known to borrow books from their collection. Now, something I love is that we don't really know know what Claire's talking about. We know that obviously this has something to do with Jamie, but we don't exactly know what this is all about, why she's so interested in all this stuff, and I, I like that. And then we get this great scene where planes just go by, Graham says that people are saying there might be a war with Russia soon, and Claire's annoyed, says there always seems to be another war, and you can tell that means a lot to Claire, because clearly something happened in the past that made her just really pissed off with war and everything, and she says she's sorry, says Jamie didn't even know what that word meant, and talks about how she called the word fuck that is, and she called him a sadist once, and he had no idea what she was talking about. They laughed about it afterwards, and Graham says whenever she talks about him, she always mentioned how grave a sense of humor he has, his smile, his hair. She says she knows he's dead and buried and moldering in the ground for the past two centuries, but she just wants to know if he really did die on the battlefield, which we basically find out that whatever happened is that Jamie died on a battlefield, and Graham says he told her he would stand and die with his men that bloody more, and she has no reason to doubt his word. Keep in mind, guys, I forgot to say this. They did not do this in the book. I looked up what the book did it's way different than what um this did now i didn't like see specifically but i do know that the book uh takes place in 1968 while this took place in the 1940s obviously now i don't know if we're gonna get to the 1960s at some point but i know that's where the book takes place and everyone and this was rapidly different which i honestly really did like because like i said in season one the thing that the show never did is actually show frank again and this did and i'm, I'm happy they did because that relation between frank and claire is just as important as the one between claire and jamie and you definitely see that here so graham says she had an extraordinary adventure one that few people could even 
even imagine to treasure it and keep it safe and, and secure, tucked away in some special place in her heart, but don't spend the rest of her days chasing a ghost. Not when there's a man who loves her still with all of her heart. Just, just get over Jamie. Even though, you know, Jamie and her, they were so close, she needs to move on. She needs to move on, and she knows that there has to be a way to do that. Even though she knows it's going to be hard, she needs to do that. And Claire then goes to Frank, asking him to come in so they can talk, and Frank says this reminds him of a night at Mrs. Barred sitting at by the fire drinking good Scottish whiskey, but much more candles. And Frank asks if she remembers, and she says, "All, of course she does, since it was their last night together." And she says she wants to tell him what happened to her after she left, and he says she doesn't have to. He wants her to know that whatever happened, wherever she's been, all that really matters to him is that she's back, and he doesn't really care about anything else. But of course, there's a lot that she needs to confess to him because obviously a lot happened um, when she was in the 1700s, and she wants to talk to someone about it. And Frank is the person that she needs to talk to about because even though he's not necessarily worried he probably is interested at least in what she's been up to and I like that he told held her that oh you don't have to tell me like he doesn't really need to know but you can tell that Frank does in fact want to know what's going on here so basically he basically she, he says to tell her story at her own pace and to save any questions he has till the end she tells him everything that happened and I love the way this was done we didn't get a whole exposition dump what they did is she started talking about what happened when she looked for the flower to remind us how this all started and after the story we see Frank paces around because obviously this is a lot to deal with I mean imagine if there was this woman in your life who just went away for a while you didn't know where she went you're freaking out looking for her and then you realize this entire time she's been in another time period I mean it, it's crazy it really is crazy. It doesn't seem like it's easy to believe. But I like Frank's reaction. He's not denying what happened to her. He's believing everything because he knows that Claire wouldn't lie to him about this kind of thing. And, you know, he knows that it's true. And she, you know, yeah, she's gone mad. And uh, he says it's quite the leap of faith, but it is one that he's prepared to make as well. She says to not patronize her. She knows it doesn't sound real. And he makes it clear he does believe her. She says she wants him to admit, even as he stands there trying to be supportive and understanding, his brain is screaming out that his ex wife, Kim Munch said ex wife, has either lost her mind or has fabricated some wild tale to drive him away. He's surprised she says ex wife. And she says she married another man. And he says she's still wearing their wedding ring. He says he admits it is hard to recognize reconcile what she's saying with anything resembling logic or even natural law, but he feels that they are beyond that, and all that matters is that she's back. She says she was with another man for two years, loved him deeply as his wife, and he says he understands, but he doesn't think she actually understands his perspective and what he had to endure while she was away. He says, when she, and of course, we know what Frank had to deal with because from that one episode, but... I mean, it really was tragic what he had to deal with, as we know. He says when she disappeared, everyone believed that she had left on her own with another man, which we remember from season one. And he says for a time he wanted to believe that so he could feel the void he felt with rage and betrayal and hatred. But he couldn't because deep down he knew whatever had happened, she did not choose to leave him, that something had taken him from her. She wouldn't just leave him. I mean, they had such a great relationship. There's no way she would have just left him. And he knew that there was something more to it. And everything she has told him tonight confirms at least that. And as for Jamie, he will not say that he understands his feelings because he can't. He just can accept everything they went through and that leaving him broke her heart. And she says she doesn't think he understands and he says he once told her there was nothing she could say or do to change the way he felt about her. And he meant it then and he me means it even more now. Tells her he loves her unconditionally and here and now and in this time he's her husband and she's his wife and they can still have a life to her. He just wants to pick up where they left off, you can tell. And basically... Then, but then it comes out, she tells him that she's pregnant, and he says it's wonderful, but then he realizes that the baby is Jamie's, and he needs to think about that and what that means for all of them, and Frank's inner rage then comes out, I mean, he's kind of like Jack a little bit here, just the way his inner rage came out, he then turns into tears, and Tobias Menzies, I mean, just killed it in this scene, didn't say a single line of dialogue, and you could just feel the inner rage and sadness within him, he walks down the stairs, Graham wishes him good morning, but he ignores her, goes in the shed, tears it apart, and then breaks down. Literally, he just starts breaking things. I mean, a very hard scene to watch. Probably as hard as, you know, Wentworth Bridge just because of how emotional it was. And... Frank then apologizes to Wakefield for all the damage, and Wakefield says it was old junk. He should have gotten rid of years ago. He says they need to focus on what's important and talks about Claire's pregnancy, and Frank says he knows that Jamie's dead, and Wakefield asks if he wants to raise a child, and Frank says they tried before she disappeared without success, and he became concern concerned that he was infertile, and he visited a doctor last year that confirmed that he is sterile, and basically they can't have children. So when he realized that Claire was pregnant, you know, he, his first feeling was joy, the flash of just happiness. And realizing this really shows, you know, why um, 
Frank was so upset. It wasn't just the fact that it was another man's baby. It's the fact that he knows that sh they can never have a child together. And this really upsets him because obviously he did want them to have a child, but now we know that he can have a child. And we remember in the first season they did talk about this and it didn't exactly work. But now we know that they can't, that they can never have a child and that Claire had a child with another man. He's obviously really upset about that because he wanted, you know, this child to be his and it can't be. And basically he says it almost feels like a hallucination because somehow suddenly in that moment he thought she meant they were having a child until he realized it couldn't be his and it had to be Jamie's and Wakefield said this kind of thing has happened before and compares it to Mary and Joseph and Frank says his, he's fairly certain that the father is not God Almighty it was a man who fucked his wife and a boy Roger then has to go outside and to play and calls Wakefield father which he's not but that is how he sees him and he stopped correcting him even though he's not his father he's actually his nephew um, Frank asks if he's going to connect his nephew to his situation the words God's plan are about to escape his lips and Wakefield says a child without a father and a man without a child had been given this chance to find one another and he does think that it's God's eternal plan and that this was the meant for to happen to them and Claire asks Frank if they can just pick up where they left off and as if he's sure about it and he says he's had two years to think about it what he wants them to be together man and wife and child they start over he says he's been offered a post at Harvard he was going to turn it down and now he's going to take it to, to Boston and says a story of the lady taking by the fairies. As long as she's there, the British press will flog it, and Claire, and Claire says to never use that word in front of her again, because of course, when she hears flog, she thinks of what happened to Jamie. I mean, we remember how bad that was, and what Jack did to Jamie all those years, and of course, Frank doesn't know about all that, but Frank says he has a condition that they will raise a child as their own, and raise with a father a living, breathing man, not the echo of the memory that they could never catch, and Claire has to be as any, any other conditions, and he says there's only one. He can't share with another man as long as he lives, and she is to stop the research and history of the century and just to forget about it all to go back to where she is stay in the 20th century stay in that time period be with Frank because that's her life that was her life but this is her life now and she needs to focus on that and she needs to let Jamie go and she says she knows she promised him she would and he made her promise that she would let him go so she will and he takes her hand and hugs her, and I can understand if many people think that they might have revealed too much here, but they really showed, you know, what Claire's gonna go through, and what eventually is gonna have to happen, and that she's gonna have to push these things away. And he says she made him very happy, and he hopes in time he'll make her happy too. She says time will leave the past behind, takes off her wedding ring, but it won't come off. Frank says to do it when she's ready, gives him her dress, she gets the ring off, keep hers and Frank's on. She then sees Frank throw her dress in the fire. Very hard to watch, but it had to happen, obviously, if she need because she needs to change things. And they then get on the plane to Boston, starting to readjust to the new world. Frank thanks her, and they get off the plane. And the score that played throughout this was just incredible. I don't know who composed that. Bear McCreary does the score. Bear McCreary, without a doubt, I mean, should be nominated for Best Score at the Emmys. Because the score in this scene was just incredible. They get off the plane. She takes his hand, smiles. And then we go back into 1745. One of the coolest transitions I've seen in a very long time. And what Ron Moore City originally wanted to do is actually have them get in the car and just have them drive away, and then it would transition into Jamie and Claire getting off the, the dock and everything. But he just felt it would be a lot more effective, and yes, it was, because this is when we realized that Frank and Claire's situation is very similar to Jamie and Claire's situation. And the rest of the episode, we then see you want to see in 1745 in France, which is where most of the season is going to take place. And uh, I just love the way all that started, because we know that Claire's going to have to deal with that. When we're going to see that again, I don't know, but it just it would make sense, because we started out the show in the fourth and we should start the second season in the 40s. It would just, I think, kind of make sense if we did that. And I don't think we don't know there are too many things that we already know because there are a lot of things we don't know. We know that Jamie dies on the battlefield, but how does he even get there? We don't know because there's a lot of things that happen in the 1745 portion of this episode that, has, that we still didn't know, and I'll get into that. So... We see Jamie and Claire just gone off the boat to France, and this is pretty much how we expected the episode to start. And I like that they didn't start it the way we wanted to start. This is how I would have thought the episode would have started, but it didn't. It started in the 1940s, which I thought was a lot more effective because we had to deal with all that. And I just really love the way they kind of played with us, you know, making us think that they were going to go to start in 1745 and they started in 1948. I thought it was really cool. And the contrast between these two worlds, I mean, very similar, definitely. There are a lot of very similar circumstances they're dealing with. 
So they just got off the boat to France, and especially when she says to new beginnings, I mean, that's exactly what Frank and Claire are doing, and that's what Jamie and Claire are doing in the sense that Jamie and Claire need to get over what happened to Jamie. Claire says she thought Jamie would knock over people trying to get off the gangway. Jamie says he couldn't take another moment on that rolling, creaking, and leaking tub, and she says she guesses a trip to Boston is out of the question, which again is interesting because we know that Frank and Claire are headed to Boston, so I thought that was interesting. He says unless she wants to bury him at sea. She says there were times she thought it would be the merciful thing to do. Murtaugh then gets off the boat, reminded how funny Murtaugh is, and I'm glad that they kept Murtaugh around because we need to keep one of them around, whether it was Dougal, whether it was, whether it was you know, any of them, um, whether it was Ian, whether it was Jenny. I'm glad that Murtaugh's here because he just feels like he fits into this. You know, he's, he's very funny. We need some comic relief. He gets off the boat, says, France reeks of dogs, just he remembers it, and uh, frogs, I mean, not dogs, just he remembers it, and Claire says what he smells is fish, and she doubts there's a seaport in all the world that smells any different, and Murtaugh says he'll arrange for some rooms somewhere away from all the stink. Someone else in the boat tosses the bags, and Murtaugh says to be careful because it's just uh, not, it's not just a sack of grain he's tossing about, so... Claire and Jamie are in their new room, obviously very hard to get comfortable. Jamie's still uh, struggling from what Jack did to him and everything, and he says something in Gaelic, and Claire asks what's wrong, and Jamie says sometimes he still feels his touch like he's there. She says she's there and not going away. He says she's had a hard one to get rid of, and she says she's stubborn just like her husband. She says they need to focus on the future and how they're going to change it, and he asks if she's talking about stopping the Jacob by um, rebellion, and she says that's what they agreed to, and basically he says he thought that they agreed to think about it, and he says if there's going to be a war against the British, shouldn't they be trying to find a way to win it instead of stopping it? Which, yeah, that would be the logical thing to do. But she says she doesn't know enough details to tell him to do that. Now, this is a very tragic scene because we know that Jamie's going to end up dying on the battlefield. We know that we just don't know everything leading up to that and what could have happened from that and how this could have happened and everything. So he asks what she does know, and she says she only knows the general outlines of history, such as Bonnie Prince Charlie coming to Scotland, raise the Jacobite, Jacobite army, and at first they have several vi victories. He says that to start and they cannot and can they not build on that and tells him to keep winning. She says she doesn't know the tactics or the strategy and doesn't even know where the armories were so there's really nothing they could do you know why they won or how they lost. She says all she knows is that eventually both sides end up on Culloden more in April 1746 and all the Jacobites are wiped out and after that the British destroy the Highland culture and retribution but that is all she knows and basically they have to just go with that. They have to basically just do what they can with that and he says that's not enough to go on and she says it starts there with Charles in France. They have to stop it there before the prince sails for Scotland. They could infiltrate the Jacobite movement, get close to the key players, discover where they got their money and arms, and find a way to disrupt their plans. He says he, she certainly has a high opinion of what a crippled Highlander and Englishwoman could accomplish, and she asks him since when he wasn't up for a challenge. She says his cousin Jared lives in Paris, and he's a Jacobite. He could vouch for them and make some introductions. He looks very concerned because he doesn't know if this is actually going to work, and he doesn't really know if they can pull this off. And she asks what he's thinking, and he says He's thinking it's not a very honorable pass she's laying out for them. He's not just lying to his cousin. They'd be lying to everyone because they can't really tell them the real reason. Obviously, Claire just can't tell everyone, oh, I'm from, you know, the future. I mean, they wouldn't believe her if she said that. Remember, Jamie, actually, Jamie was the only one to believe her. And... She says he has to remember what's at stake. They're talking about tens of thousands of lives and the future of Scotland itself, and that definitely should be worth the price. He asks her that price is their souls, and she says that won't happen. They won't let it. They have to trust in this, and he says in this he does, and in this he will. So he says he'll write a letter to Jared asking for his help. He struggles to get out of the bed, goes to write the letter, and basically, I love his line where he says, what the hell we're going to tell Murtaugh, because Murtaugh, of course, doesn't really know what this is all about. He doesn't know that Claire's from all those years ago. They go to Murtaugh, don't tell him much. They tell him that they can't say much more. He says he trusts them with his life, but it seems to him they don't trust him to know the true reason for doing this. Claire says they told him they want to stop the Jacobite rising, and Murtaugh says that that is the purpose of the lie. It's not the reason, and Jamie says the rising is doomed to failure. It must not happen, and Murtaugh says, again, it's the reason, and he says the true reason behind it remains carefully hidden. They're hiding it from him. Claire says he's right, and she says they're keeping it hidden, and Jamie says one day they'll tell him the reason. When the time is right, they don't know when that's going to be, but Claire asks Jamie what that might be. He says for her to tell him because she's the one from the future, and it's a lot to deal with, obviously. I mean, we know how Frank took it. How the hell is Murtaugh going to take it? I mean, Murtaugh doesn't know all those things. So we then jump to three weeks later, and we meet Jared, who is played by Robert Carlyle, and I don't watch Once Upon a Time anymore, as you guys know, but it's great to see Robert Car Carlyle on this kind of show, because I think he's good once upon a time. The show just is not as, you know, he's too good for that show. He really is great here. I love the role he plays, and I think he does a great job. He says he admires their patriotism, to be sure, but he's curious as their son change of heart, because Jamie says he's never really expressed interest, um, 
in, you know, patriotism and patriotism and he doesn't understand why all of a sudden he is interested in these politics and basically Janie says not to worry about it, and basically we see um you know he says all the time he never heard him voice and to be known as a Jacobite is a badge of honor supports the true faith against the heretic on the throne but they have enemies for sure that would delight in watching them dance a jig on the gallows back in England and while the cause is many friends only a few are called brother and they are the old one with the fire of the righteousness burning in their hearts and he asks what is the fire that burns within him and shows Jared the brand and scars from Jack and obviously that's why he's doing this he's doing this because he wants to obviously move on he wants to move on from those burn and those scars Jack's gone Jamie says it's in courtesy of the British Army because yeah that was all the British Army as we know Jack was part of that and asked him if any man needs further reason to rise up against the king that allows such horrors to be carried out in his name Jared agrees the cause can only be strengthened by his sword he's sorry he doubted him Jamie asks if he'll help them he asks what exactly they want him to do and Jamie says he wants to meet the Jacobite leaders face to face to hear their plans and how they mean to carry them out. Jared asks why they should meet with him, a wanted man in his country now, come to France with a price on his head, and now much more in the clothes on his back. And Jamie says he thinks the Stuarts would value the support of Laird Brock Turok and the Fraser clan should they plan on returning to Scotland in the near future. And basically, Jared says he will think it over, but in the meantime, he believes that they can be of help to one another. An another, he says, he's been delaying a trip to the West Indies until he could find something competent, someone competent and trustworthy enough to run the wine business in his absence. And he thinks that Jamie would be good at that kind of thing, but Jamie says he doesn't really know much about it. And Jared says that he'll be fine, though, because he knows a lot about drinking and things like that. And basically tells him he will get 35% of the profits at first 25, but Jamie insists to be 35 along with his help. And Jared says he will do just fine they shake on the deal and basically claire narrates that what jamie inspected this while jamie inspected the shipment of port she went for a walk and was beginning to be susceptible to morning sickness obviously because she's pregnant and while the air law on the docks wasn't exactly fresh it was better than the close confines of their temporary home so claire sees chaos going on in the ship and jamie and jared find her she tries to get through the crowd she says she's a healer and she says the captain tried to stop her because he knew the truth finds a man who is sick and jamie at first tries to get her away from the woman but claire says if if it's what she thinks it is, she should be fine, and won't contract it, she thinks it's smallpox, I mean the man, not the woman, she thinks it's smallpox, as we meet the Comte Saint Germain, if you guys don't know who that is, you guys remember, here's how I'm going to reference it best, and this is really the only way for me that I can understand it, you guys know Les Mis, when you had um, Jean Valjean as Monsieur Le Maire, kind of the man in charge of everything, that's who the Comte is, this is the man that's in charge of everything, he's the man that kind of scares everyone, and he runs the town. So he wants to see what's going on. The captain comes in, tells Claire that she's a stupid woman, and I'm pretty sure the Comte is going to be one of the big villains of this season. You can already tell he has a very sinister agenda, and you don't really know what it is, which we'll get into. Jamie gets into a fight with him, says to speak his wife with more respect. Claire says the man's already dead. The heart, and basically the Comte says the woman is telling the truth. It is indeed smallpox and orders everyone to leave. Claire says they must set up a quarantine immediately. I love that mo a lot of this was in French. I thought that was really daring the way the show did that, because of course they didn't do that in the first season. I'm pretty sure they did do some scenes in Gaelic, but not in actual French. I thought that was really cool. So he tells Jamie they need to contact the local medical authorities, and Jamie says is a medical left best with the port authorities, and there's really nothing that Claire can do because of that. So Claire says she can't just leave him behind, and Jamie says to trust him, but she goes to help the man anyway. She doesn't care. She knows that this is smallpox, and of course, we know that Claire's a doctor, so there really is nothing wrong with what she's doing. But the Comte says that they must take these men to a quiet place. He has rooms where no one will ever know and the captain says the news will be all over the docks now the law is clear he has no choice he must arrange the destruction of a ship and cargo and this really infuriates the Comte because now obviously now they know a smallpox they have to get rid of it and Jamie tells her they have to go there's nothing more she can do here they start to leave but are stopped by the Comte who asks who they are she says her name and that she's a healer the Comte says he should have known an English woman would be so ill-bred and vulgar Jamie says she's his wife Lady Brock to rock and the Comte says the English gave out titles like pearls before swine and Jared says says, squabbling in the place is beneath their dignity and asks who they are and explains to the Comte that Jamie's his cousin and that them being there is completely by chance done nothing more than state the truth. The men is smallpox and 
that they just need to realize that, that the man has smallpox and there's nothing more to it. And he tells Claire that his entire shipment cargo will be destroyed. She says the cost is nothing compared to letting the disease spread throughout the city, which, yeah, that's the best thing to do. I mean, destroy the ship. We don't know. There could be someone could contract it. Obviously, the ship is contaminated. They need to destroy it. And he says she will pay a price. They both will. And we don't know what that means, what the Comte is going to do, what he wants to do to them, what his revenge is going to be. I mean, that's something I'm very interested in, is seeing what the Comte actually wants to do to all of them. But later than I the entire ship is set on fire. Jared lets them know the Comte will not forget what happened. They've made an enemy there today. And Jamie says, another country, another enemy. And tells Claire, life with her is never dull. She says she will try to be more dull if that would suit him better. He says he wouldn't change a thing about her. They leave in a carriage as the man watches his ship burn. And that's how the episode ends. So overall, guys, great premiere. I absolutely love this premiere. And I really like how different it was from last season. We can already tell we're dealing with a lot different um, things this season That's not as this. that's not the same as last season. There's a lot more to deal with. We're dealing with a lot more of the French culture. We're going to learn a lot more about that. Obviously, Scotland is still in there because of Jamie and everything, but we're dealing more with France, and I'm definitely interested in seeing what's going to happen there. Is Jamie going to be able to infiltrate the army? And plus, going back to 1948, how does Clara get back? Because obviously, we know she gets back there. What causes her to get back? What ends up happening? Basically, how does Jamie end up dying on the battlefield? These are things we need to know, and I love the way the episode introduced it to things without directly telling us what's going on. I mean, a lot of shows, you know, they would directly tell us what's going on, but this introduced, it, it, they introduced it, but they didn't tell us what's going on, which I definitely like, because I don't want to know what's going on, and I want to be kept hidden, I want those things to be kept secret, and I want to be surprised as the show goes on, so I'm definitely interested in seeing what happens there. Um, as far as uh, Frank and Claire go, when are we going to catch up with that? Because that definitely is going to come back at some point. I don't know if that's going to be season three or if we're going to see that again this season. But that's something else I'm very interested in seeing is, is Claire going to be able to get over all the damage and everything? Is she going to move on from it? We'll have to see what happens there. That's going to be very interesting. Uh, Jamie and Claire, what does the Comte have planned for them? We know that there's something he has planned. We don't know what that's going to be. It looks like next week they're going to meet the Stewarts, and then we're really going to get introduced to all those characters, which I really like. Like I said, I like that the show's going in a more French direction. Direction. I think that's really good. I like the show's not trying to do a repeat of last season. It's way different than last season already, which I'm definitely very happy about. And I'm also wondering, is Jamie going to be able to fully recover from what Jack did to him? Because it seems like he can, but he's still very weak. And I think that'll always be there. Like, what Jack did, it will always be there. He'll always remember what Jack did. But they need to move on from that. And can they move on? That's really my question. I mean, it's not going to be easy to do, obviously. There was a lot that Jack did to him physically, mentally, and it might not be as easy for him to move on as they think. But we'll have to see what happens there. I like seeing Murtaugh in the group as well. And I'm wondering, when is Jamie actually going to tell Murtaugh what's going on? Because he's telling Murtaugh, I'll tell you when the time is right. When is the time going to be right? And does Jamie get to tell? Because we know Jamie dies on the battlefield. So does he get to tell Murtaugh what's going on? We don't really know. We're going to have to see what happens there. Um, and also, I'm hearing they might take a major time jump in the second half of this season. Because I know we get I know we do get introduced to Jamie and Claire's daughter eventually. Uh, they've already kind of spoiled that by casting her. But I don't think they spoil them too much like we don't really know what happens we know that Jamie dies in the battlefield but we don't know what Charles says we don't know how the whole Jacobite army starts we don't know how he gets to talk to the Jacobite army we don't know this stuff and this is stuff I want to know this stuff I'm very interested in and like I said I'm already look we're already looking at a very different season a great season definitely that I think could honestly top next last season but um definitely it's gonna be very different and I'm happy about that let me know if you guys saw this premiere absolutely loved it can't wait for the second episode unfortunately I have to wait a week because that it obviously the premiere is Saturday and I have to wait two Saturdays from now but I can't wait for the next episode I know you guys saw this episode love to hear your thoughts on it. and what do you think of the uh, way the episode starts because I love to hear your thoughts on that I, I'm thinking a lot of people are going to be very confused as to why we saw that I really think they were just trying to show what Claire is going to have to endure once she comes back and kind of set up um, you know that this mission that they're pulling off is kind of a failure as we'll see so let me know what you guys saw this episode love to hear your thoughts on it um, I know it deviated from the books a bit what do you guys think about that very how do you have Outlander back. Let me know what you guys saw this episode. We'll see you guys in my next video, which will be for a movie review, and I'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.